So what is in the transducer? So the endoscopic ultrasound scopes um, house a, a small uh, transducer that's made up of these uh, tiny crystals that when stimulated will ring. And that, that ringing is what emits the endoscopic ultrasound wave. And that wave will then transmit from the tip of the endoscope or the probe into the adjacent tissue that is being targeted by the endoscopist. Those waves will ultimately band together to form one unified beam that will be received back into the endoscopic ultrasound probe and an image will be generated. I'm going to try not to, to bore people too much with the, with the physics of, of ultrasound and admittedly I, I don't think I'm an expert in any, uh, any way, shape or form, but essentially what we have is the endoscopic ultrasound will admit these waves um, that will then penetrate into the adjacent tissue. And depending upon the density and the makeup of the tissue, those waves will be reflected, absorbed, or transmitted through those structures. A proportion of the emitted waves will come back to the transducer, and again, in real time, will, it will construct an image based on those received waves. This is my, my go-to slide to, to say that, that endoscopic ultrasound really is just 50 shades of gray. Um, whether it's my fellows that I'm teaching or, or fellow endoscopists that come into the room, they, I can just see the glazed over look when they stare at my screen and they see you know, variable shades of gray uh, transmitted there. But it's, it's these differing levels of gray that relate to different amplitudes of the waves being returned back to the probe. And it's quite important for documentation of normal anatomy and identification of abnormal anatomy. So the, the endoscopic ultrasound waves can, can be manipulated. The frequency of the waves can be manipulated in terms of their frequency. And if you think about the frequency of the waves as how many waves are reaching a single point in a single point in time, when it's a low frequency wave as demonstrated on the upper um, panel here, you're getting sort of a coarse or a general assessment of the tissue density or echogenicity as we, as we refer to it. Whereas when you have high frequency wave, you're having a high level of repeated amplitude waves going through the, the tissue structure and returning back to the receiver. And so you get more detail or depth. And so this can be manipulated by us and the, and the technology on the endoscopic ultrasound platform. And it also will give us more information on um, the, the, the target tissue details. So when, it, when a tissue is closer to us, it tends to have more waves go through it and we'll have a, a more detailed assessment of it versus where it's further away, you'll have a lower frequency of returned echoes coming back to the receiver. So the, the terminology, uh, we refer to things by echogenicity, um, and so these really just break down to, to colors or those shades of gray. So anechoic refers to essentially no echoes, nothing coming back to the receiver. And so that would appear as black on endoscopic ultrasound, and you'll see that on the left two panels, the upper and lower panels there. Uh, anechoic will refer to um, something without tissue density. So those would be hollow cavities, um, um, uh, blood vessels, the bladder, um, cystic structures. Now they won't be airfield structures because um, for anybody who's had an ultrasound before and they want you to fill your bladder, they, air is the enemy of, of, of any kind of ultrasound uh, technology. Um, Ultrasound waves do not transmit well through air. It often, it often just creates artifacts. So when we see an anechoic structure, we know it's a fluid field structure in general, rather than an air field structure. Hypoechoic means um, less reflective or, or, or reduced amount of echoes coming back compared to the neighboring structures. And so the, we, we always will have a means of comparison. So you know, if we use the pancreas as example and we refer to something as hypoechoic, it's hypoechoic relative to the remainder of the pancreatic tissue. And this is relevant because most malignancies um, tend to be hypoechoic uh, relative to the, to the adjacent normal tissue with, a, with uh, a few exceptions. Hyperechoic, as you can now deduce, is, is a high reflectivity or high frequency of echoes returning back uh, to the um, transducer, and that would include things such as calcium deposits, um, fat-rich substances, 
um, stone disease, which we'll come to in a little bit. So those things will tend to be um, bright white or um, higher density on, on the uh, EUS probe compared to the adjacent structures. And then there are some things that are isoechoic. So they have very similar, if not identical, echogenicity to the neighboring structure. And so there are a few types of cancers, neuroendocrine tumors, for example, in the pancreas can be isoechoic. And so they can be quite subtle and difficult to find um, because they have the very similar uh, returning signal as the adjacent pancreatic tissue. So common indications for endoscopic ultrasound, pancreatic cysts uh, far and away remain probably one of the most common reasons we do endoscopic ultrasound. When I, when I first started um, 10 years ago now, pancreatic cysts dominated most of what we did with endoscopic ultrasound, and, and that's for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, we find more cysts in general now. We, we do more CT scans, more MRIs, more abdominal ultrasounds on people, and so incidentally pancreatic cysts are found more often and two we we used to examine every cyst with endoscopic ultrasound or a lot of them but you know fortunately our understanding of, of, of pancreatic cyst disease has improved dramatically and now we tend not to rely on endoscopic ultrasound to examine the majority of cysts but instead reserve that for cysts that may require intervention or, or further characterization um, cancer um, from um, top to bottom, so esophageal, gastric, duodenal, uh, pancreatic, gallbladder, biliary, um, even renal cell carcinoma, splenic cancers, uh, mediastinal tumors, and all the way down into the anal rectal region um, are all readily accessible for endoscopic ultrasound for assessment, staging, and diagnosis. Uh, pancreatic cancer is still one of the more common ones that we uh, will see. Uh, to put it in context, prior to endoscopic ultrasound, the, the general way of tissue acquisition or, or confirmation of biopsy was, was to do a transabdominal image-guided biopsy. So that'd be a big needle going through your abdomen or through your back to, to biopsy a cancer. Now, um, Endoscopic ultrasound is the, the absolute mainstay for that diagnosis. Uh, we have ready access to the pancreas. It's a painless procedure for the patient and, and highly, highely accurate. Uh, gallstone disease, and so, so endoscopic ultrasound has largely revolutionized our management of gallstone disease. Um, we can have very intimate visualization of the gallbladder and the biliary tree. And so we can document with high accuracy the presence or absence of gallstones and, and help uh, determine what interventions are most appropriate. And so even today, for example, we had a young lady with uh, abdominal pain and elevated liver enzymes. And there was a question as to whether or not she had a common bile duct stone. Uh, my team did, a, did an endoscopic ultrasound on her. Um, the endoscopic ultrasound showed a dilated duct but no stones, and so we prevented having to do an ERCP on this young lady, and, and importantly, uh, prevented exposing her to risks of, of procedural complications such as pancreatitis. So um, endoscopic ultrasound has really changed the way we manage gallstone disease um, in, in these symptomatic patients. Other common ones are subepithelial lesions, so the lumps and bumps of the GI tract. So an individual has an endoscopy for another reason, and an endoscopist finds a bump in the system that's not coming from the mucosa or surface layer. Uh, endoscopic ultrasound can very nicely document what layer that's coming from, and we can tell often just visually what the lesion is, but then we can um, you know, acquire tissue if necessary to help make the diagnosis. And then finally, abdominal pain, or, or, or what I like to call the I don't know. We get a lot of referrals to EUS that just basically say, I don't know what's going on, so can, can you just look around and see if you can find something? Um, but in, in all seriousness, you know, we can have a more in-depth uh, upper GI investigation than, than a regular endoscopy in, it, in individuals with abdominal pain. We can find subclinical chronic pancreatitis or um, biliary microlithiasis, um, you know, as a potential cause for abdominal pain that may not have been seen on other investigations. So the two types of endoscopic ultrasound scopes, so uh, we have linear and radial, those are the terms that we use to describe our two scopes, um, and essentially they, they relate to how they image. So I'll start with actually the bottom panel, which is the radial scope. So the radioscope in most 
um, instances is a forward viewing endoscope. So an endoscopically looks exactly like a gastroscope. Um, and so when you're driving um, forward, you can see exactly where you're going. Uh, the radioscope images in a 360 degree uh, form around the axis of the endoscope. And that's quite important because it, it sort of gives you a very logical um, approach to how you visualize. So for example, when you're in the esophagus and you, you put the aorta on the left, you know what should be on the right side of the esophagus just by virtue of thinking if you were in a cylinder and looking around, you would know what to expect in different areas. The linear, on the other hand, is a little bit different. The linear, the, the best way I can describe it is a swimmer who is in a pool with their head looking toward the bottom of the pool. And that's sort of the view that you're, you get. So you don't see to your sides and you don't see what's above you outside of the pool, but you're basically looking at the pool floor. And if there were something to reach down, you could reach down and grab it. And so that's the, the, the sort of the convex imaging that you, you obtain with the linear uh, endoscope. Um, the, the, the endoscopic image is, is not forward viewing with, with our Pentax linear endoscope. It's, it's a little bit more oblique, so it's, it's almost looking out of your front windshield, but over to the side. So it, it, that takes a little bit more practice to get used to driving. Again, this just shows um, the, the, the two scopes and the relative planes of imaging. So if you look at the top one, endoscopically, you would be looking forward. So along that long axis of the endoscope, but the endoscopic ultrasound image is above, below, right, and left of you in a 360 degree configuration. The linear echo endoscope, again, you may not um, see exactly what you're looking for with the endoscopic view, but you know that the echo endoscopic view is below you in this convex plane um, uh, underneath the transducer. And that's relevant because you can see on that on that bottom plane that that little diagonal line here, this one here, refers to a needle biopsy. Okay, so this needle biopsy will come out of our scope and it'll be within our endoscopic ultrasound plane. Whereas if you imagine the radial scope, well, here is, here is the plane of my scope. So if I put a needle out here, that's no longer in my plane of imaging, which is why we don't do needle biopsies with a radial echo endoscope. The, the, the plane of imaging is not compatible with the working channel of the endoscope. This just shows sort of a static image of, of a radial echo endoscope image. So you can see this here, this large circular structure is the probe of the endoscopic ultrasound. And we get we had a 360 degree view. This is just a luminal view of probably the stomach. And what it's highlighting nicely are the layers of the stomach. And so I'm not sure how well it transmits, but you can sort of see a white, black, white alternating pattern. And those are the layers of the gastric wall and if somebody had a subepithelial lesion there, we would be able to determine exactly which layer it was originating from and, and um, apply a diagnosis to it very likely.